Well, thanks. Thanks, Josh. Very interesting. In fact, it ties in pretty nicely with what General Brown and General Pernit spoke of this morning about, you know, how do you use this uh, volume of data that is increasingly available to decision makers? So thanks, uh, Josh and LMI, for that uh, great presentation. So we'll move now to, uh, to our afternoon panel. Thanks for the, 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 the loyalists who are here after lunch on, on day two. We're very glad to see you. I think uh, uh, building upon the yesterday's panels and this morning's panels, we'll now to move to a panel, <clears throat> panel conversation on combat readiness for multi-domain operations. And uh, that, that uh, setting the stage for us for that discussion will be General Mike Garrett, the commander of the United States Army Forces Command. And as those of you know, Forces Command is the Army's largest command. Uh, and it is really where the total Army is forged. A regular Army, Army National Guard, uh, Army Reserve, and Army civilians across the, across the Army. So we're very fortunate that, that General Garrett, with his tremendous operational experience in multiple theaters, uh, has taken some time to set the stage for us. Uh, it's a great panel. The panel chair is Lieutenant General Laura Richardson, the Deputy Commanding General of, of the United States Army Forces Command and as Under Secretary of the Army McCarthy recognized yesterday, uh, recently served as a, a long period of time as, uh, as Acting Commander of Forces Command. The, moder the panel moderator for this afternoon's panel is Lieutenant General Retired Sean McFarlane, a uh, senior fellow for us at the Association of the United States Army. And the panel members are, are General Bob Brown, U.S. Army Pacific, uh, again uh, displaying the uh, Army uh, green uniform. Major General Jim Mingus, Commander, 82nd Airborne Division. Major General Glenn Curtis, the Adjutant General of the State of Louisiana and President of the Adjutant General Association of the United States Army. Dr. Bruce Stanley, Professor at the Army School of Advanced Military Studies. And Major General Felix Gedney, Deputy Commanding General, Third Corps, Though he will, as you will see, and those of you who know Felix, he wears a different uniform than all the rest of us. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome General Mike Garrett, Commanding General, United States Army Forces Command. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, it is, uh, it's good to be here, and it's good to see you, and as General Ham mentioned, I am uh, in day five uh, on the job, and you know, when you take any new position, there are opportunities uh, afforded to you uh, early on that won't necessarily be afforded to you uh, down the road, and, and I'm trying to take advantage of that. So again, thanks everybody for attending the forum. Combat Readiness for Multi-Domain Operations. You know, as with any transition, and I'm talking about my personal transition from commander of United States Army Central and really the end user of Force Com soldiers and units for the last three and a half years, there's a transition and there's a critical requirement. It's kind of what I'm going through now as the Force Com commander to understand not only where we are, but to also understand uh, where we need to go. And it's through this approach that will help ensure that we're successful going forward. And over the last few years, ForceCom has made tremendous strides in generating and sustaining readiness and increasing lethality. You know, General Abrams, General Milley, and our Army leadership, and really everybody had a hand in this uh, the work that uh, has, has occurred over the last two and a half years to get us to the point where we are today uh, in terms of uh, our forces um, is almost unprecedented, you know, when you think about it. But it has taken uh, a complete effort by everyone. And then there were people, as I mentioned, General uh, Abrams, uh, but I'd also, you know, like to mention uh, the ForceCom Deputy Commander, my deputy, uh, Lieutenant General Laura Richardson, who has been steady at the helm of this ship. I guess you shouldn't use naval metaphors, but steady uh, leading Forcecom uh, over the last five months 
Uh, and and, and uh, as you can imagine, the job of the force comp commander, imagine trying to do uh, both of those jobs. And Laura did it uh, very, very well. So Laura, uh, again, publicly, thank you uh, for leading force comp and for uh, helping me transition to this job. So tremendous strides have been made in generating and sustaining readiness and increasing lethality. Initiatives such as the sustainable readiness model, coupled with increased rigor at our combat training centers, decisive action training environment rotations, expanded no-notice EDRI programs, fully funded home station training, all of these have produced unprecedented results. And these efforts have produced the most ready force we have seen since transitioning from coin operations. But we've yet to meet our readiness goals. Today's security and operational environment continues to evolve. Our near-peer adversaries are in continuous competition across all domains, land, air, sea, space, and cyber. Through political, military, economic, and geographic efforts, our competitors employ anti-access area denial systems that create the effect of standoff across time and space. In these times of competition, this means that our opponents seek to disrupt and distance our government and military systems by creating ambiguity and slowing the speed of our reaction. In times of armed conflict, the objective of our adversaries is to separate and disrupt our joint force in time, space, and function. In doing so, our opponents increase their freedom of action while reducing our own. It's a strategy to effectively neutralize our ability to project power globally, negating our operational advantage. And through strategic information campaigns, our adversaries are making progress. And as you've heard our leadership say on many occasions, they are closing the overmatch gap. Today's security environment requires our nation to adapt and expand our military capabilities in order to counter the evolving threat while simultaneously maintaining a world-class ready force. A force not only that is able to fight tonight, but also a force that is able to sustain itself through the fight. We should and we are challenging, you know, where we are currently and determining and trying to best understand where we need to go in order to readily provide and project capabilities essential to our national defense. Our confidence at adaptation provides the National Command Authority increased options in pursuit of our national defense strategy. The multi-domain operations or MDO concept is designed to maximize the strengths of our joint force to best deter com conflict and defeat aggressions across all domains. MDO is not a projection of the future environment. It's an acknowledgement of the environment we are operating in today and the environment that we will continue to operate in in the near future. There's still work to be done both intellectually and in the field as our Army, along with our sister services, hone a sharpened fighting force with the agility to deter and to defeat our adversaries. And Forces Command has an important role to play. The mission of ForceCom is to train and prepare a combat-ready, globally responsive total force in order to build and sustain readiness to meet combatant commander requirements. And as I mentioned at the beginning, as the end users of MDO, our operational commanders provide feedback to us. And they do that through a number of ways, 
principally through TRADOC, who then adjusts and sends improvements out to the force, and we incorporate those into our training centers, our warfighter forums, our joint exp experimentation, and other opportunities. Readiness is, and will remain, our number one priority. But we are contributing in meaningful ways to mature the concept of multi-domain operations. So I'd ask that you consider the following during our panel today. How do we enable our forces forward to compete and win across the multiple domains now and in the future? How do we secure multiple options for us to be able to rapidly project power as part of the joint force? How do we ready the force to rapidly create and seize upon asymmetric advantages, opportunities? And from a force comm perspective, how do we do this while maintaining current operations and sustaining readiness? I think if we can answer these questions correctly, we can secure tactical, operational, and strategic success. I've asked our panel to address their efforts in creating, providing, and sustaining a joint capable force. I've challenged them also to present how we can, are, or should create efficiencies or increase effectiveness to enable rapid power projection and joint integration. You know, the panel is ordered along the contact, blunt, and surge concept referenced in the 2018 National Defense Strategy to demonstrate our calibrated force posture and to communicate and help folks understand the tyranny of time in power projection. Our panelists' comments will highlight the necessity of our forces to adapt to meet our current and emerging threats. We'll start with an informative historical framework to provide context and build common understanding. Dr. Bruce Stanley from the School of Advanced Military Studies will lead us through a historical review of the Solomon Islands campaign of World War II. And I believe this campaign echoes many of the concepts emphasized within our MDO today. The ability to seize and retain the initiative is still critical to our success. Integrating or converging all of the elements of combat power is essential to victory. Projecting and sustaining a lethal force over great distance concedes both an operational and a strategic advantage. So during the panel, I ask that you think critically about how we should adapt our forces, our training, and our constructs to provide a ready force that is prepared to create asymmetric advantages, rapidly achieve convergence as part of the joint force. So I now turn over the panel to uh, General Richardson, who will moderate this, and along with my dear friend, General McFarland, uh, let, lead us through the panel. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. I'm Lieutenant General Laura Richardson, as General Garrett said, DCG for Forces Command, and I'm so glad General Garrett is here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, I'm the panel chair for the readiness panel, and um, I'll provide some remarks on a couple of the initiatives that we're doing in Forcecom to increase readiness and lethality for multi-domain operations. And I'd like to also introduce our panel members, uh, and afterwards, um, when everyone is done speaking, we'll open the floor to uh, some Q&A. But following my remarks, Dr. Bruce Stanley, professor at the Army School of Advanced Military Studies, will provide a historical overview of the Solomon Islands campaign and its relevance today for operating in the environment and the concepts emphasized in our uh, MDO. General Bob Brown, Commander U.S. Army Pacific, will provide us his thoughts on the continuous competition environment presented to forward presence forces, changes that have occurred, and how we're building readiness in the Indo-PACOM theater. Major General Jim Mingus, Commander 82nd Airborne Division, will address the blunt layer and efforts required to enable light and expeditionary forces to fulfill their role in MDO, and he'll also emphasize the value of robust, well-trained, and exercised airborne and air assault force to execute dynamic force employment. 
And as you can see, we're not going to go in order. We're kind of going to go um, back and forth on the panel. Major General Felix Gedney, Deputy Commanding General for the 3rd Mobile Armored Corps, will discuss the surge layer and how 3 Corps is enabling our heavy forces in multi-domain operations. And then he'll also highlight the advantages of partner capabilities. Major General Glenn Curtis, we're very glad to have him here today, Adjutant General for the Louisiana National Guard. And he'll also discuss the surge layer and the National Guard's very important role, uh, as well as current efforts to maintain a ready force while simultaneously meeting current operational requirements. And so that I'm, I'm very confident that uh, you'll find this material presented here today to be thought-provoking and relevant to all of us as professionals. And I strongly encourage you to engage with our panelists during the Q&A session um, immediately uh, after our remarks and then also after the panel if you so choose. But as General Garrett mentioned in his opening remarks, uh, Forcecom has significantly increased the readiness and lethality across the total army. One of the ways we're getting after this is through our combat training centers, uh, through these rotations. Our CTC rotations are rigorous. They're crucible experiences for the, for the commands. Uh, and these train our units, obviously, in the decisive action environment. But no longer is there a scripted scenario with predictable and manageable pauses in the fight. Uh, as General Abrams would say, it's not your daddy's rotation anymore. Um, but anyway, uh, units encounter a thinking enemy that provides reaction and counteraction, and again, unscripted. In synchronization with the development of the multi-domain operations, units face opposition and multiple dilemmas in all of the domains, and they're facing that now. And this means that they, op they have to operate at a much faster op-tempo of large-scale contingency operations. Across the total army, we've seen very successful rotations. Divisions, brigades, battalions are aggressively jumping their command posts multiple times to the, through the rotations. Cyber threats are aggressively trying to access and disrupt our mission command systems during these rotations. And young leaders at company level are executing live fires with intense lethality and well-synchronized enablers. Forcecom units are also building our expeditionary mindset. And as we hone ability, our ability to rapidly project power, we are conducting level three EDRIs across our army. <clears throat> and you may have read or heard about our most recent one, which is the second armored brigade combat team from the first armored division, which just executed a no-notice EDRI to Poland. And they're currently there, heavily engaged in a three-week long training exercise uh, in Europe. <clears throat> and Major General Gadney will talk more about that. But my point is, is that we're training now to effectively deter the future threat and if required, defeat that threat with, with lethality. Let me re reiterate that jo what General Garrett said in his remarks, Forcecom has a very important role, obviously, in the maturation of uh, multi-domain operations. At our CTCs, through the warfighters, through the EDRIs, our readiness forums, our warfighter forums. Um, we're executing the concept now and we're providing feedback. Again, I strongly encourage you to engage with our panelists and Dr. Stanley, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Lieutenant General Richardson. Thank you for the, the kind introduction. Uh, I'd like to thank General Garrett for the invitation to participate uh, on this panel to discuss combat readiness and multi-domain operations. Uh, it's truly an honor uh, to sit on a panel with such great leaders uh, to my left and right. I'd be remiss if I didn't send out a special thanks to both General Townsend and Lieutenant General Lundy for letting me slip away from SAMS for a couple of days to spend a few days here with you. Uh, both of them have set up perfect conditions for us uh, where we're able to take the time to train and educate some uh, of the finest leaders in our Army and our Joint Force and our multinational partners. Uh, we're doing our part every day to assure uh, combat readiness. Over the past several years, the concept of multi-domain operations has emerged as a theory of action for how the U.S. Army contributes to the joint force to deter and defeat Chinese and Russian aggression in both competition and conflict. In particular, the theory of action presumes that all domains are contested and that the U.S. military dominance is not assured. 
The central idea is that the U.S. Army, as part of a joint force, will penetrate and disintegrate enemy access and area denial systems and exploit the resolent freedom of maneuver to achieve strategic objectives. As General Milley pointed out in the forward to the new TRADOC PAM 525-3-1 U.S. Army and Multi-Domain Operations 2028, the concept of MDO provides the first step in the doctrinal evolution regarding how the Army way of war must evolve and adapt. Furthermore, he challenges us to read, study, and dissect the multi-domain operations concept. As such, the TRADOC PAM provides a foundation for continued discussion, analysis, and development. This presentation focuses on convergence, one of the major tenets of multi-domain operations, and suggests that a, a study of a historical example can improve that conceptual understanding of the theory of action and help us prepare our Army to deter and defeat aggression in competition and in conflict. One of the five operational problems that the U.S. Army as part of the Joint Force must solve is the disintegration of the enemy's access, anti-access, and area denial systems in the deep areas to enable operational and tactical maneuver. To overcome the problem, the concept of multi-domain operations proposes the tenet of convergence. Convergence is defined in the TRADOC PAM as the rapid and continuous integration of capabilities in all domains that optimizes effects to overmatch the enemy through cross-domain synergy and multiple forms of attack. The goal of convergence is to complicate the enemy's attempts to conceal and defend its center of gravity by providing the joint force with multiple options for attacking the enemy's vulnerabilities at decisive spaces. However, the lessons learned from the field so far highlight that there are conceptual shortfalls in understanding and improving training designs that emphasize the concept of convergence. Therefore, studying a historical example of where the concept of convergence is achieved can help us in improving not only our understanding of the idea, but also serve as a guide to improving the readiness and capability development of the U.S. Army that facilitates that mission command of multi-domain operations. Additionally, historical examples can highlight some of the gaps in readiness and help the U.S. Army understand how we fit in the overall campaign plan. Next slide, please. One such historical example is the Solomon Island campaign in the Pacific Theater during the early stages of World War II. While there are certainly other historical examples, this campaign illustrates how the joint force achieved convergence during this, this late part of the disintegration phase of the campaign. For the past several years, we've used the Solomon Island campaigns as part of the School of Advanced Military Studies curriculum to illustrate the theory of operational art. However, with the introduction of the book Island of Destiny into the curriculum, it quickly became apparent that this historical example provided a way to illustrate and, and understand the emerging concepts proposed in multi-domain operations in addition to the study of operational art. In the book, uh, the author, Prados points out that by the summer of 1942, the U.S. military was reeling from the Japanese offense in the Pacific and clearly on the operational and strategic defense. Following the battles of the Coral Sea and Midway, U.S. military commanders in the Pacific decided to transition to the operational offense to counter the emerging threat on the island of Guadalcanal and the southern Solomon Island chain. Thus, Operation Watchtower was initiated on the 7th of August, 1942, and lasted for six months, with the campaign concluding on the 9th of February, 1943. There were three distinct phases to the campaign. Penetrate the enemy's strategic and operational anti-access and area of denial system, disintegrate the components of the enemy's military system, and exploit freedom of maneuver necessary to achieve strategic and operational objectives. Next slide, please. During the first phase, uh, excuse me, the first phase began on 7 August with a joint force, forcible entry amphibious landing of two regiments of the 1st Marine Division on Guadalcanal to secure and open Henderson Field, and generally ended around the 20th of August with the arrival 
of the first of 31 American fixed-wing aircraft, and then the final regiment of the 1st Marine Division. Henderson Field was and continued to be the operational center of gravity that the Americans had to protect. This penetration phase is characteristic of the episodic synchronization that occurs when conducting joint operations as described in multi-domain operations. The second phase began with a series of Japanese air, naval, and land operations to isolate the 1st Marine Division on Guadalcanal and reduce Henderson Field. The Americans were clearly on the operational defense during this phase and fighting to gain the initiative. The second phase ended with the destruction of the Japanese surface naval fleet and American dominance in the maritime domain, the disintegration of the Japanese air capability and dominance in the air domain, and defeat of the Japanese army on Guadalcanal and dominance in the land domain. And finally, uh, throughout the disintegration phase, there was primarily a uh, complete dominance in the EMS domain uh, during this portion of the campaign. However, this did not come without a significant fight over a three-month period punctuated by major naval battles, daily air battles, and three major Japanese land offensives against the defensive perimeter protecting Henderson Field. The air and naval battles between at 12 and 14 November 1942, which destroyed the Japanese surface three fleet threatening Henderson Field, and the subsequent destruction of the Japanese troops transports delivering the final Japanese division reinforcements to the island was the turning point for the Americans. The third phase began with the American shift from the operational defense to the operational offense in all domains. A surge of forces in the land, maritime, and air domain occurred throughout the months of November and December, which brought the land component strength to three divisions, including one National Guard division, with the Corps headquarters. The air component comprised over 100 aircraft operating out of Henderson Field, and a maritime component, including one British aircraft carrier, now completely dominating the waters in and around Guadalcanal, ensuring a secure sea line of communication to the island. In turn, the 14th Corps commander, commanded by Lieutenant General Alexander Patch, was able to begin offensive operations and clear the island of Japanese forces. The last Japanese troops withdrew on the night of the 7th of February, 1943, six months to the day of the 1st Marine Division's landing at Laguna Point on 7 August, 1942. Next slide, please. The question for us is, is what is required for the Army to penetrate and disintegrate the enemy's access, anti-access, and area denial systems in order to enable operational and tactical maneuver while rapidly and continuously integrating capabilities in the land domain that helps that cross-domain synergy. <coughs> First, forward presence of the operational forces allowed commanders in the Pacific to respond quickly to the threat posed by the Japanese on Guadalcanal. A secure line of communications from Hawaii through the Southeast Pacific, secure A-pods, S-pods, and ISBs, the ability to conduct maintenance forward, continuous sustainment of the force, and a robust medical infrastructure allowed the rapid buildup of capabilities in the area of operations in and around Guadalcanal to extend the commander's operational reach. Second, the availability of a formation capable of joint force entry allowed the commanders in the Pacific to respond immediately with a force that was not only trained but equipped for the most part for the challenges they faced after securing Henderson Field. The force was not only able to conduct offensive operations to secure a lodgment, they were able to successfully conduct an operational defense for three months to protect the operational center of gravity, Henderson Field, until relieved by follow-on forces. As such, this resilient formation was able to resist operational culmination despite being unable to protect itself in all domains, particularly the air and the maritime domain. Third, the ability to generate a force capable of operational maneuver, the 14th Corps, which included the 25th Division, the Americal Division with three National Guard regiments, and the 2nd Marine Division in a very short period of time that was trained and equipped allowed the commanders in the Pacific to transition to the operational offense, which highlights the goal of MDO, tenet of convergence. 
This force had the capability of operational command and control of a joint force that could seize the initiative and exploit its advantage of high tempo operational maneuver. History demonstrates that multi-domain operations against a near-peer adversary may not be new. However, through a study of the Solomon Islands campaign, the U.S. Army can gain a better under conceptual understanding of how to conduct operations across all domains to achieve the goal of convergence in the decisive space to defeat an adversary that presents that anti-access area denial challenge that prevents us from achieving our military and political objectives. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Stanley. I will tell you, I'm so glad he chose to use a uh, Pacific scenario from World War II, the Solomon Islands campaign. Contrary to popular belief, I was not at the Battle of Sol Solomon Islands. <laughs> <clears throat> and, uh, but it's a tremendous example we learned from history. I talked earlier about how multi-domain operations is an evolutionary process. We see evolving here the air, maritime, and land domains working together, add in that today cyber and space, uh, and you see how we, we have evolved, uh, no, no doubt about it. It's a lesson of history, though, that we, we can't afford to, uh, uh, you know, to, to ignore. We, we can't afford to f have to fight our way back into the Western Pacific. Very, very difficult, uh, as we had to do in this example and many others in World War II. Forward position forces uh, competing enable us to be postured if competition escalates to crisis or conflict. And better yet, they're really a critical deterrent to those who would do us harm so you can prevent a conflict altogether. So really that posture, presence, and partners are absolutely key here. So a great lesson from history. And as we look at readiness for multi-domain operations, there's a whole bunch of lessons we're working right now, building readiness uh, for multi-domain operations every single day in the Indo-Pacific region, forward in the theater, during competition. I think that's a change. Yes, you do it at home station, but you must build that readiness forward with allies and partners in the theater. You can't build it at home station and then use it all up as you're deployed uh, forward. Uh, you're, in fact, postured uh, and the contact force, in our case, the, the responsibility that we have, you got to continue to build that readiness in uh, multi-domain operations during this hyper-competition as well. So there's not any, you know, slack periods or phase zeros anymore when nothing's happening, you're forward and building it. So as we look at building readiness forward, I think it's also important, you know, we have the basics. Shoot, move, and communicate. Basics that you've got to, that blocking and tackling you've got to do in readiness. And I'll tell you what's, what's emerging is that that has changed. It has to change. You have to do the blocking and tackling. But if you think about it, if you're doing the basics, shoot, move, and communicate, and you don't include any cyber, for example, uh, in your training, well, you're, you're going to be defeated in every domain. If you don't include some capabilities we had and we've lost over time, like electronic warfare capabilities, if you don't include things like SHORAD, uh, if you don't include things today like counter UAS or how do you deal with drone swarms, those are some of the things you're going to have to add in to the basics of blocking and tackling uh, in multi-domain operations that haven't been there before. Quite a challenge, because it's not like we have extra time in building readiness. We're going to have to incorporate it into realistic training events that get at it. And I think uh, one of the advantages of, again, being the contact force and your forward, uh, allies and partners are key to that. And, and so you can't just uh, at home station, very difficult. You can't get allies and partners to come, and we even had them, as General Richardson was talking about, uh, our great combat training centers. They are, uh, they, it is unbelievable. I was just uh, watching our first uh, Brigade 25th Striker Brigade combat team uh, at NTC a month or so ago, and it's unbelievable the complexity. And we had a regiment uh, from the Japanese Ground Self-Defense Force, a tank regiment with them, training, which is fantastic in the way we need to go. But that's not always the case. Uh, but I would tell you that the CTCs are getting at that complexity, uh, all those things I mentioned, and you've got to do it forward as well. So some of the additional ways as we look with the Indo, in the uh, Indo-Pacific, uh, of course, we've got the, the very successful Pacific pathways where we've adjusted from uh, going four or five locations for weeks at a time to staying in the priority countries uh, within Indo-PACOM and the National Defense Strategy 
uh, for longer periods of time, four to six months. And during that four to six months, you are building readiness. You build in those events, those complex live fires and those events that help you build and sustain that readiness. And again, include your allies and partners. So at the same time you're building that readiness, you're building your allies and partners so critical, a big advantage we have. Again, when you look at China does not have the allies we do or the partners, uh, nor does Russia as you look at uh, co competitors out there. Another way is uh, the multi-domain task force, uh, the newest formation in multi-domain ops. They are present in the theater during competition phase and part of the exercises, again, where you can uh, test out, uh, work out, uh, going from really concept to doctrine. And, and I think, again, Dr. Stanley, what a tremendous example because we've seen convergence is one of the key things coming out of the concept. It's rolling right into doctrine, and he had described it extremely well in the Solomon Islands. And I would say it could be very similar to today, except add in additional domains and, and additional maneuver uh, in multiple domains to positions of advantage. Uh, and, and then you'll have a very similar uh, successful operation if you do it right. Another one is Defender Pacific, which involves uh, Forces Command and those uh, blunt forces coming over. Uh, a division headquarters and several brigades starting in 2020 uh, that will uh, do essentially a, a major exercise, joint exercise in the Indo-Pacific theater uh, to a scale never done before and scenarios never done before. And South China Sea scenario, for example, uh, East China Sea scenario, uh, and those uh, type scenarios where uh, they can come and they're working with the contact forces that are already forward and work all their systems, and while they're doing it, they're going to have to build readiness. They'll have to be, again, in those exercises where uh, they're uh, really uh, stressed uh, by the level of the exercise and the rigorous live fires and exercises and work with allies and partners will be key in incorporating those basics that have adjusted, as I talked about, within the scenario. So really a key part of readiness forward and at home station, multi-domain operations, the basics are different. It gets to you know, a key point, you can't build the relationships uh, once the crisis starts. You have to have the relationships formed and you're gonna be in a heck of a lot better shape uh, to go from crisis back to status quo and competition, not escalate into conflict, but if it does, uh, you're gonna be ready uh, because you've been with your allies and partners, you've been working your readiness and your systems and you're not getting ready at home station and then losing it as you're deployed uh, forward uh, in the theater, you're building it and gaining it. Uh, so we look forward to your uh, questions and, uh, and really uh, this is just a great and relevant topic. And again, thanks uh, Dr. Stanley, a great job of an example for us uh, back from World War II that still applies today. Thank you, sir. Light didn't come on. Wanted to make sure it was working. I, I too, am honored to, to be here the, this afternoon and uh, to build upon General Brown and Dr. Stanley. I kind of represent the, the blunt uh, force component of this. Um, and many often believe that forces like the 82nd represent that, that blunt force, but I would remind that there are heavy, there are striker, there's other, many other forces within Forces Command uh, and within the United States Army that are prepared to do that uh, blunt component of this. As it relates to multi-domain operations, and if you think through the A2AD and the preclusionary tactics of our enemy, um, in concert with the continuum of what MDO lays out, compete, penetrate, disintegrate, exploit, and then recompete, what I'm going to talk about today is kind of represents the penetrate and disintegrate uh, component of that. If you look at joint doctrine, um, it lays out five reasons why you would conduct a joint forcible entry operation. Uh, for our forces inside the 82nd Airborne Division, it applies, four of those five apply to us. And what I try to do is put it in to very simple terms in terms of what does that, that mean for the, the larger joint force. If you think about Market Garden in World War II uh, and seizing terrain, it was all about the bridges to break out from Belgium, go north and kind of finish that that was out there. And so that's an example of seizing key, key terrain. We are lucky enough, we're gonna celebrate our 75th anniversary of D-Day uh, this June. Um, that particular operation in Normandy, that was about destroying critical infrastructure or a threat. It was about the fires enterprise. It was about the pillboxes. It was critical infrastructure as well and exploiting maneuver, uh, but it was about uh, the, the threat itself. 
Desert Shield, Desert Storm, 91-92 uh, time frame, the division deployed, so from a flexible deterrent or flexible response option, uh, if you need to put a force somewhere very, very quickly anywhere in the world, uh, that is an option as well. Uh, facilitate maneuver, tactical to strategic. The Swaki Gap that we talk about all the time, if that land bridge were to be closed, that 63-kilometer front with really no assailable flank, it almost forces you into either a penetration or some type of large-scale frontal assault. So a vertical envelopment, um, either by airborne assault or air assault, is a key method in which you could offset uh, the need to potentially do that. And then finally, the one that we think about most often, and that's secure a lodgment for follow-on forces. Uh, as has been pointed out, and one of the tenets of multi-domain operations is that all domains will be contested. Um, at the end of the day, that means that our APODs and our SPODs or our C and air port of entries will not necessarily be there. We may have to have amphibious, marine, U.S. Army forces that go in and secure those kind of things. But from a broader uh, JFE, we try to boil it down very simply to four big problems, regardless of what that environment is. That is, first, you have to be able to penetrate and deliver the force. You've got to be able to command and control from a joint perspective to get the force there. You've got to be able to protect that force once it's in, and then you have to be able to sustain it. Our methodology, as you kind of move to the middle portion of this, because we live in a world of unknowns, and it is a global problem, uh, we have to stick with the basics. And as General Brown pointed out, it is fundamentals and basics. Um, and that's not just the individual level, but all the way up to battalion and brigade and even division. We try to treat a battalion and or brigade level airborne assault almost like a battle drill where the terms isolate lead, isolate trail, team assault, team clear, inner airhead line, outer airhead line, all those just roll off the tongue from the youngest trooper all the way up to our senior leaders that are out there. That's juxtaposed uh, amongst a climate that we've had uh, since World War II, and that's the term LGOPs, or little groups of paratroopers, uh, which in short is if you have a basic understanding of the commander's intent and the mission a couple levels up, you understand what's important, uh, you're bringing troopers together to go forward and execute that mission dis despite uh, what's going on around you. It's a culture that allows our paratroopers to truly thrive in chaos. The other thing that we try and do to, to inculcate this is that everything we do from a training perspective, we try and treat like either a deployment readiness exercise or an emergency deployment readiness exercise. Um, our third brigade will deploy to, to, uh, to theater, uh, to the CENTCOM theater this summer. Um, in accordance with the chief and force comp commander's guidance, we want to make sure that they get an externally evaluated uh, battalion FTX before they go, which is a known event, but we treated it like a deployment readiness exercise. So we alerted on Monday morning of this week, 3rd Brigade of the 82nd, no notice. We allowed them to plan. Uh, they're going through their rehearsals right now, combined arms rock drills, and they will jump in to multiple drop zones uh, this Friday night and then transition into a situational training exercise that will get them ready for their, for their actual deployment. The geographic combatant commanders, um, PACOM, UCOM, SOUTHCOM, AFRICOM, NORTHCOM, and CENTCOM. Over the course of the last year, we've either been in one of those theaters, are in one of those theaters, have participated in an exercise in one of those theaters, or will participate in an exercise in one of those theaters um, in the coming months that, that's up here. And what that helps us do is really come back from a razor's edge perspective, uh, focus our training objectives to ensure that we're meeting those geographic component commanders' um, objectives. Just came, the plans team and myself just came back from a um, big planning event in Rock Trail and PACOM, and next week we will go to UCOM with General Cavoli uh, to get ready for a big uh, training event this, this summer. But it also, and General Brown kind of alluded to this, it, it allows us to understand who those planners are. In a crisis, you don't want to have to get to know people. You have to know not just who's on those staffs, uh, but who those partners that you're going to potentially have to be out there. So it gives us a jump start on that. We host a global response forum, uh, or GRF forum, every quarter. Uh, and when folks think of the GRF, uh, they think just the 82nd, but the reality is, is there's a postal unit from Fort Lewis, there's heavy units from Fort Hood, there's heavy units from Fort Bliss. That Global Response Forum gives General Garrett and the, our leadership a menu of options in a crisis. O-Plan involvement, we try and stay very involved in, in that as well, uh, so we understand what those requirements are, and it comes back and, and drives our, our training requirements. 
The last thing that I wanted to, to leave you is a little vignette from our recent warfighter that we, we fought uh, back the end of January and first part of February. We had the luxury of being able to execute two uh, warfighter trainups almost full up before we went into this. And so uh, we felt like we could experiment trying to use as much of what FM30 and Unified Land Operation lays out in conjunction with the concepts described in multi-domain operations. And there were three big takeaways that, that we walked away on the back end of our warfighter. Number one is if you look at the enemy's integrated fires complex, from theater down to tactical, his collection, his ability to deliver, uh, depending, regardless of the threat that you're talking about, anybody, anybody that has that preclusionary capability around the world, he doesn't parse it out by echelon. He's going to put the best sensor in the best place. He's going to put the best communications architecture to tie that together, and he's going to deliver based on who is in the possession, best position to fire. If you take a portion of that sensor system out, he's got another one that will replace it. If you take a portion of his fire system out, he's got another one that replaces it. And yet we in our military, we have a tendency to kind of bifurcate our by echelon where those fires are. What we tried is to treat ours like the enemy does as one ecosystem, and we were lucky enough to fight with who's going to follow me here with uh, General Felix uh, with three Corps, who embraced that idea as well, and the impacts on the enemy was, uh, was pretty profound. The second is that this is not a light fight, this is not a heavy fight, this is not a striker fight, this is not an airborne fight, or an air, it's all of those things combined. Uh, when you look at the threat and the terrain that's out there, it is going to take a combined task force, a joint coalition combined task force. Uh, to be able to be successful going into the future. And finally, we, we talk often of um, providing the enemy with, with multiple dilemmas, and Dr. Stanley kind of alluded to this with his idea of convergence that is, is uh, there in history. What we try to do is repeated and very rapid compounding effects, airborne, air assault, deep attack, combat aviation, cyber, SAP, STO, all those things in a very, very rapid succession to not just overwhelm him on the ground, but also intellectually and mentally. Uh, and if you can bring those compounding effects uh, in a very, very rapid fashion, you will take him out of his decision cycle. Uh, I thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to your questions, and I will hand it over to my colleague, Felix. Thanks, Jim. And um, ma'am, thanks for the invitation to speak. It's a privilege to be uh, on this panel. Um, I'm going to offer you five thoughts, uh, and I'm a British officer, but I've spent a lot of time with the U.S. military, so I'm going to try and do it without uh, any uh, British military vernacular or cryptic analogies. Um, and my first is about the requirement for heavier forces in um, multi-domain operations. Um, multi-domain operations, one of the key tenets is a calibrated force posture. Uh, and what that means is that we have to be able to dial up that force posture uh, when and if required. And that leads to a requirement to deploy at scale, uh, at speed, at short notice. And this is a significant shift from um, the uh, R4 Gen model, which saw program deployments of set force packages, uh, deliberate transition into an existing theater. And the sustained readiness model now requires us to be ready to deploy rapidly at scale, as I've said, with a more dynamic entry into theater, possibly theater opening, uh, and then sustain multi-domain operations, which are likely to include large-scale uh, combat operations. And the increased training tempo to reach the levels of readiness that we require, uh, including those increased and harder CTC rotations that General Richard spoke about, uh, is increasing our supply and maintenance challenge in order to sustain the fleet. Um, the good side of that is that it's also giving us much greater confidence uh, in the readiness of our fleet because we're consistently using it. So the problem for us, and especially within a heavy core like three core, is not so much that we move from R4 Gen to SRM, but the fact that we're doing both at the moment. Uh, and then you've also heard General Brown and General Garrett speak about the importance then of making sure that as we deploy units, we don't eat redness while they're deployed. We have to be able to sustain that redness while they're downrange so that units come back and there isn't too much of a delta for us to try and capture back up at home station. So my second point really is what 
what is required to, to generate redness? And I would, I would say, put simply, there are three things, resources, time, and understanding. Uh, right now, our, our biggest constraints are, and limiting factors are time and understanding. Time to get all the maintenance done, time to get all the training done, uh, and also then the level of understanding we have within the army of how we conduct um, procedures, uh, tactics that we would have been used to and would have been routine uh, before we deployed over 18 years of low intensity conflict and coin. But it's not just unit level readiness uh, because we have to make sure that our installations and particularly those major force generation installations are capable of force projecting and meeting the demands of projecting rapidly and at scale. A railhead, staging area, uh, all of the consumables we need to move people out quickly. And then those, you, those installations, particularly the MFGIs, have to be able to sustain that force generation after deployment in order to continue to sustain, especially if we get into a large-scale war fighting. And that's particularly so for the uh, Compo 2 and 3, and, and I'm sure that Major General Curtis will expand on that. And as we track our readiness, uh, which we do very well in terms of personnel, equipment on hand, and maintenance levels and training, we mustn't forget our, our deployability readiness. Um, those skills and abilities that units have to be able to get themselves uh, into theatre uh, from CONUS. So my, my third point, and again it's been alluded to already, is that being ready is not enough. We have to be seen to be ready. Um, the deployment readiness exercises, the, the EDRIs, are hugely important. Uh, and as you've heard right now, um, Third Corps, uh, we have um, Second Brigade Combat Team of First Armored Division uh, deployed um, on an EDRI um, a week ago uh, to Europe. And these deployments are hugely valuable to us to learn the lessons about what we need to do to make sure we've got the resources in the right place, make sure we can achieve that deployment. But they also pretty, send a pretty strong message to our adversaries that we can put combat power at uh, the light level, the, he the heavy level, wherever we want to, uh, when we choose to. My fourth point is that in order to be ready for multi-domain uh, domain operations, we have to train the integration of all domains of warfare in order to achieve the, and I quote, rapid and continuous integration of all domains of warfare. And this is especially so uh, when it comes to uh, interacting with our non-military partners, and specifically in the information domain, uh, diplomatic domain, the humanitarian and the stabilization domain. Uh, and I would argue that we have exceptionally good doctrine in all of these areas, but um, 13 months deployed in Operation Inherent Resolve highlighted once again to me that the reality is quite a long way from the doctrine that we have. My final point, uh, and as the Brit, uh, you would expect me to highlight the importance of multinationality. It's, it's been uh, mentioned before, but I'd say that um, the complexity of multi-domain operations presents increasing challenges to our ability to interoperate. Uh, right now, um, a Third Corps headquarters going into warfighter 19-4. We have a UK division uh, linking in with us, um, which is good. Uh, but we have to train that multinationality and the interagency bit I talked about routinely and often because, uh, as I think General Brown said, we simply will not have time to do it if we want to get out of the door uh, rapidly when the time comes. That's me, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, General Garrick, General Richardson, uh, Force Comm, thank you for allowing me to be here today to talk about the National Guard and our reserve forces in the Army, which, however, uh, which, by the way, makes up over 50 percent of our total Army. So what is the mission of the National Guard and Reserve leadership for a non-federalized, non-mobilized force? It is simply to administer, equip, maintain, and train its units. What that boils down to is personnel readiness, equipment readiness, and training readiness. It means we have to be ready with little to no notification to deploy, deploy combat forces that can conduct and support unified land operations. 
To put it simply, we not only need to be ready faster, we must be more ready faster. To quote General Milley, we must increase combat readiness through well-equipped, well-maintained, and well-trained personnel and units, end quote. We must mobilize and deploy at the speed that our nation needs us to move. Ultimately, we must provide combat-ready forces that provide the lethal capabilities the, the COCOM commander requires at the speed of relevance for decisive operations under MDO. So then the question becomes, how? As the combat reserve of the Army, how fast does the nation need us to be ready? That question must drive how resourcing decisions should be made. So how do we continue to adapt to generate readiness at the speed of war? This really boils down to the resources we invest and the levels of training that we require. Under resources, a key component in the reserve is our full-time manning. Our full-time manning, although a handful of soldiers at <coughs> unit level, is critical to generating readiness in personnel, training, and logistics. Those few Active Guard and Reserve soldiers are charged with handling all the functions of the unit when the unit is not doing an IDT period, i.e. weekend drills, or at their annual training. They also have to ensure that the unit is prepared to conduct collective training, whether it's on IDT weekend or at annual training, and we must maximize that training time to get the absolute most out of it. So how do we connect the dots with our full-time manning? These are the things that it must be able to provide. Full-time manning drives these things. More personnel are administratively and ready to deploy. We have higher qualification rates for our individual weapons and our crews. So our crews are able to hire higher, level, uh, higher, higher levels of their tables so that when they get to a mob station, they start at a higher point. It drives, can we have companies at company proficiency or are they at a platoon efficiency? Or are they at platoon efficiency versus a squad proficiency? It means more time with the soldier with an M4 in his hand putting uh, weapons, uh, bullets down range instead of that weapon simply sitting in the weapons rack. It means more time, stick time, for operators on their equipment. More ready, faster. Equipping is another resourcing decision. We must ensure that the equipping and modernization of our reserve forces is interoperable, concurrent, and balanced. This is key to allow rapid integration with the joint force across all domains. Equipping, fielding, and modernization must be concurrent and proportional and tied to the SRM cycle, providing maximum readiness at the right time. This will be a come-as-you-are fight. So as an example of what I'm talking about, if you look across the Army National Guard today, the infantry brigades in, in the National Guard are at least one generation behind on their mission command systems for the Army, which, which gets at the on-the-move capabilities. This results in capability gaps and, and interoperability challenges. Disparity in equipment could risk the combatant commander's ability to properly employ these forces and risk losing the initiative in the surge. An inability to communicate specifically with higher headquarters or adjacent units, and it means that we will possibly be less survivable and have less lethal weapon systems when we arrive. So now I'll talk about training the force a little bit that I've touched on full-time manning and equipping. We must train to provide the combat-ready forces to provide the capabilities that the COCOM commander requires. There are a couple of key uh, uh, touch points in this. I've mentioned full-time manning. I've mentioned the training or, or the uh, equipping piece. Another one is, is we have to maximize our available training time. In the reserve components, we have so few moments, if you will, with our soldiers that we constantly have to shed off uh, what I call training distractors, whether they be briefings, um, those type things, so, so that when we, are, when we have that unit there, we have those soldiers there, we're moving into a major training event, whether it's weapons qualification, some type of maneuvers, uh, so that we maximize that time and we bring down the post mob training dates as much as we can. It goes back to, as mentioned before, kind of the basic blocking and tackling. I will also tell you that we have to remain involved in things like warfighters, the XCTC, and the CTC rotations. For our BCTs, our enablers, 
These training events are key collective milestones and prepare our soldiers for the difficulties of combat. Increasing the CTC rotations from two to four per year was a significant step in, in uh, supporting our ability to be ready faster. We must continue to employ the National Guard and Reserve to support gift map deployments and to participate in COCOM exercises. It's easy to draw a straight line between gift map deployments and readiness. Preparing for and deploying to support COCOM exercises is not only a great readiness generator, they also create key touch points to allow non gift map units to employ their readiness, which in turn help generate and retain more readiness at the soldier, leader, and unit level. As with our comp Compo 1 counterparts, our reserves have to not only be seen, be ready, but they have to be seen as ready. The utilization of the Guard and Reserve in these training opportunities is immense, and I will give you an example of that. In Louisiana, we have our 256 Infantry Brigade. This summer it goes to the JRTC for, for a rotation for training. Next year it will go to Pacific Pathways, or that's where it's scheduled to go. So we will continue to build on that readiness as we move forward into and through Pacific Pathways. Under mobilization, I would tell you that, that we have to continue to adapt our mobilization model uh, so that we, we directly focus on what that unit needs to be able to do in theater. And what this means is, is there will be units that we mobilize that will need to go to the MFGIs, conduct post, co conduct post mobilization training, and do a mission rehearsal exercises. But it also means that other units will simply do a touch and go at an MFGI and then deploy forward, while others will probably mobilize at home station and deploy immediately to theater. Most of those are in an enablers piece of it. So one of the things that, as an answer in general, I worry about a lot is, is the homeland. Uh, and we, we as, as we talk through multi-domain operations, I think it's uh, relevant to touch on the homeland. Um, we must be prepared for, and we must plan to defend the homeland. Uh, this means not only for wildfires and floods and hurricanes that we typically maybe think about, but if we get into a no-kidding war fight with someone like a China or a Russia, I can almost assure you that they will try to conduct cyber attacks in our homeland to slow us down or impede our forces from moving forward. They also will try to conduct terrorist attacks to accomplish the same effects. What this means is, is as if that happens, units that were supposed to move forward uh, going east or west may have to stay in the continental United States to take care of Amer American citizens. So we need, to, we need to build that into our thinking process. The last thought I would leave with you is, is for the reserves, it is a constant balancing act that we have to struggle with on a daily basis of how do we keep units ready to deploy, how do we deploy them as we have for the last 18 years into a war fight, then we bring them home, we get into catastrophic events inside the, inside the homeland in our states, we bring them out to do that. We ask them to do a lot of their educational stuff and their leader development in a non-pay status, online if you will, at nighttime. How do they manage that with their families, with their careers, with their lives? Uh, so it, it is, there is no easy answer. It is, it is a constant struggle that we have to, to, uh, to look at and try to influence. But at the end of the day, we have to retain as many of those soldiers as we can so that our units are filled and we have to be able to recruit into those units. Because for me, the first readiness indicator of a unit is, is what's its end strength. And all the other quality points fall out from there. If your unit is at strength, then you can start working on all the other key points that you need to have a ready force that can move forward. With that, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, that uh, completes all of our uh, panelists' uh, presentations, and I have a few uh, uh, questions up here from the audience, but I'm going to exercise my prerogative as the moderator to ask the first question of my uh, old squad mate, uh, General Bob Brown, yeah. um, and uh, ask you uh, what uh, role do you see for echelon above brigade in multi-domain operations, and uh, what's the primary uh, impediment to uh, making that a, uh, a reality? 
Oh, great question. And uh, uh, Sean carried me through West Point many years ago. Uh, and uh, I knew he'd pick on me a little bit. <laughs> I think he'd start right away. Uh, but uh, that's a great question. And I, I think, uh, you know, uh, Mike Garrett touched on it and uh, uh, several other, Eric Wesley touched on it earlier. There, there is certainly, as we look at multi-domain operations, there are uh, numerous roles, echelons above brigade, uh, where you are synchronizing and pulling together this joint effort. Uh, and it requires beyond modularity. It, it may be, we, we don't know yet, it may be that modular brigades are certainly a, a key way to fight multi-domain, but we do know, or, or it may be more of a division-controlled uh, uh, effort, but what we do know is above the brigade level, clearly you're going to need uh, theater army. You're going to need uh, uh, below that, a, I would uh, say a key, it looks like, is a field army. Uh, and cores are critical. And this is, uh, as you look at the connective tissue with the joint force and the level of, uh, in all domains uh, that you're dealing with, maneuver in all domains, particularly cyber and space, uh, but also uh, air, maritime, and land, those elements, those echelons are key. Now, the challenge with that is, again, uh, uh, you know, there, there aren't a whole bunch of folks sitting around with nothing to do. Hey, just go create those organizations. They've got to come from somewhere. So uh, definitely showing that it's needed as you're – it's a very complex. Uh, the good news is it requires joint integration. We are farther along joint-wise than uh, any other force, but we're still not far enough along. And uh, one of the missing links are those echelons above brigade. Uh, I'll give you an example. When we looked at the uh, multi-domain task force and the, uh, as it's forward with elements, including the uh, intel, information, operations, cyber, electronic warfare, and space, the I2Qs portion, we originally thought that was really uh, perfect for a core or below level and what we found uh, after numerous exercises and operations where it was most effective was more at the JTF level, and so it was more of a theater asset, a different level than we suspected. Uh, and as, uh, as the capability has been proven, uh, there, you know, uh, you've got to look at how do you form those other echelons and how do you work those, and then again, the joint aspect of it, so they may not look exactly as they used to look like. It may be uh, that they're much more of a, of a joint organization than we ever envisioned. And uh, at the uh, combat command level, I'll say what's happening is they're seeing this, and uh, while we have one multi-domain task force now, uh, the combat commander would like four. You know, so again, uh, uh, they see the value of it, and uh, they realize how it's uh, across their entire theater, very, very useful. Uh, and, and so we've got to figure those, those things out. They're not easy. Now, we've got a good start with some of the doctrine coming forward, FM30 and some of the other doctrine. And they're working the Echelons Above Brigade doctrine and the Theater Army doctrine right now. And we're hand in hand with uh, Leavenworth, TRADOC on that uh, as we're learning, sharing it with them. So they've got the latest and greatest what's happening. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, the next one will be for our, uh, uh, the chairman of our panel, uh, Laura, uh, what, uh, somebody has asked for an update on the status of Objective T, and I'd kind of like to hear it myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the, uh, uh, in terms of Objective T, the Army uh, has not made the final decision on Objective T, so I think that that will come sometime in the future, but uh, in terms of um, Objective T and reporting, most of our units are reporting uh, to the Objective T standard. Uh, as well uh, in terms of doing the dual reporting and making sure that when we do finally go to Objective T that um, we already know how to do it and that kind of thing and we don't take a dip uh, in our readiness because we aren't familiar with it. Okay. All right. Uh, so then the next one I'll ask for uh, Jim, spreading it around a little bit. Uh, when you're doing a uh, your uh, joint forceful entry operations. How do you incorporate cyber, MISO, EW, and I'll add in MILDEC into your uh, operations, Jim? Sir, from the, most of us from the time we were brought up, you start with uh, what do we know about the enemy? Uh, where's he weak? Where's he strong? Where are we weak? Where are we strong? Uh, we develop a scheme maneuver, ground tactical plan, and we backwards plan off of all of that. 
Um, what we found in both our warfighters and other exercises that we are, have done is it, it starts with a scheme of enablers, scheme of fires, um, using all those, as I described earlier, those compounding effects uh, to actually set up the maneuver. If you try and lead with your face um, like we did and got away with for, for so many years, then, then it's not going to be as successful as, as you would want to. So uh, in not just in MDO, but in, in 3.0 as well, in Unified Land Operations, the combination of all those effects, uh, cyber stow, um, fires, and, and all that, bringing it together from a, a multi-domain perspective, preceding the actual maneuver itself, and in particular for a joint forcible entry operation, if, if you don't bring all that together, you're not going to be able to penetrate the airspace. You're not going to be able to suppress the enemy air defense. You're not going to be able to actually deliver the force uh, to go and execute the mission that you've been asked to do. Okay. Uh, so this is, uh, I'll give this one to, to Felix because uh, sustainment tends to affect uh, America's hammer disproportionately. Uh, and the question is on... Uh, uh, sustainment of expeditionary operations and multi-domain operations. Uh, how do we uh, sustain ourselves uh, in combat with large formations over an extended period of time, um, given uh, the current uh, status of our sustainment force that tends to rely uh, on contract solutions, which may not be available against a pure adversary? So the, the very simple answer is we do it exactly the same way as we do in barracks. Uh, and we do in barracks as we do in the field. That, that's what we're aiming for. Um, and, and indeed, we are, I would argue, we're more challenged by our level of understanding of those procedures and, and contractors play a role in that. So one of the things we have to do is make sure every time we let a UME contract, we make sure a part of that is training. Uh, there should be no civilian working on a armored vehicle within third corps that doesn't have a a, a green suit next to him, either watching or assisting, because we need to spread that understanding and regrow the, re the expertise, particularly in unit level maintenance. Um, but it's wider than that, because of course we need to make sure that we um, use those systems that we have available to us routinely in, in, the, in the home station. VSATs need to be up. We need to use exactly the same networks that we deploy out of the field. Uh, and then the final point I say is we have to deploy them into the field. We have to make sure that we routinely take out on NTC rotations all of our sustainment capability uh, because we'll get called out if we don't. Because, as an example, doing supply activity out in the NTC, potentially on the peninsula, is very different from doing it in a hangar in Fort Carson where everything's neat and tidy and, and easy. So we've got to be able to um, uh, practice and exercise our sustainment units routinely in the field uh, doing their job while maneuvering uh, in the battle space. So okay. could I, could I, I add on that? I was going to ask Laura to follow <laughs> up on that because uh, there's a capacity question in there. Too, so. Well, so the, um, I would say the uh, time and again at our CTCs, it's very evident that if you don't come in, if a unit does not come in with the basics, so we talk about reps and sets, and if they don't come in with a basic foundation uh, of, of knowing their business and knowing the sustainment, it will eat their lunch in terms of the operational tempo of the rotation. And they can't, if, if they don't come in with strong foundations in that, it'll just, it gums them up by, you know, about day six of the rotation. And so um, uh, we know that uh, just from about the past couple of years, uh, in terms of building back those reps and sets just in the sustainment part of it, Every time that I would go to the CTC, if General Abrams wasn't able to go, he would tell me, make sure you tell that brigade commander if they can't, they can't outrun their sustainment. If they can't keep up with it, then they need to stop and they need to maintain their equipment and then they'll start again. But he was absolutely against, he, he was of the philosophy that the training is, uh, that sustaining is training and that you didn't outrun your maintenance. So. Um, we put a lot of things in place within Forces Command to help bring back that level of knowledge. Our IG inspections on field level maintenance, you know, give us the justification of where that education level is uh, from having so many contracts and being on FOBs and things like that and, and building back that capability uh, in terms of being able to keep up with the operational tempo that's going to be required of um, MDO.
Okay, so are you going to cover the force structure issue then, General Brown? No, I, I wanted to cover, you know, amateurs talk tactics, experts, logistics. <laughs> and uh, really, the tyranny of distance is alive and well in the Pacific. And this is the, uh, the, one of the toughest issues as we look at multi-domain operations. We recently did a logistics tabletop exercise where we got all the experts joint uh, across the board and realized, you know, there has to be a much greater, there's no doubt, much greater cooperation, collaboration in setting the theater, uh, where pre-positioned stocks are, how you move these capabilities around. Things like watercraft in the Pacific are, are critical. Uh, another example, uh, you know, we've got to include it. We, set, we tend to shortchange logistics and exercises. We kind of, yeah, everything's there in an exercise. And, and uh, the Indo-PACOM commander uh, just last week said, no, we are emphasizing logistics and we're going to put an incredible push on logistics and all exercises to stress the system, much as was talked about we're doing at CTC, same in theater. And finally, it, you know, just innovative solutions that the Joint Force may have. One example that came up as we were working through this, for example, the Navy has some underwater fuel blivets. Well, what a great thing. They're underwater, access to them when you need them. On near one of those islands where you have a multi-domain task force, that's a great solution for your fuel. And there's dozens more like that as you work together with the other services of how we get at this in a manner, and again, a more joint manner than we have in the past. I do have a thought. Yeah, I, I was going to actually get you the next time, but go ahead, Glenn, uh, if you want to step and get up on the firing step. Yes, sir. Right well, thank you. So, so when, I, when I think about sustainment, it became obvious to me probably, I don't know, three or four years ago, that we had raised uh, mid-grade officers and NCOs that had no idea what a log pack was. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they had no concept of it because the, the war we'd been asking them to fight in, we were deploying forward to Afghanistan or into Iraq where we had Brown and Root and other contractors that did er ran everything for, from, you know, cafeterias to washing clothes, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so, so log pack was just a foreign concept to them. And, and uh, so my Sergeant Major and I, basically forced our units back out into the field and we throttled back on the, on the, if you will, the high speed training as we perceived it, you know, shooting on a range or, or, or doing maneuvers and that type thing. And we started, I had SAR majors and I had colonels out now teaching majors and captains and first sergeants and E7s, so I'm first class, basically what log pack was, how do you sustain yourself, how, what's the field craft that you need to go through. I, I would tell you that that we've, we've moved the needle a little bit, but it's something we absolutely have to stay focused on so that we can sustain ourselves in a much longer fight. Okay, uh, th thanks Glenn. And uh, I I'm gonna follow up with, with you and, and everybody else here on the panel that wants to chime in. Uh, and the question is, is that it seems as though we're training at a pace for future war that is actually degrading readiness uh, because of the tempo uh, that we're, uh, operating at. So how do we modernize our formations? And, and I, you kind of talked to the, the tempo versus uh, stopping to sustain a little bit there, Laura. Um, but the broader question is, is, is beyond that, it's also how do we also find time and, and white space for modernizing our formations? Um, and uh, that per, uh, is particularly applicable for compost two and three according to the question here. So I'll start with you, Glenn. How sure. do you balance all that? <clears throat> so, so we, and I, and I tried to talk to it a little bit through my comments. Um, you know, it, it, it all, for me, it always goes back to how much can your full-time force get done for you before your, your M-Day traditional soldiers show up at the armory. So, so if you peel that onion back a little bit, most of our company size units have three full-timers in it. Most of our battalions have about 25 people, AGRs working in them. So that, that cadre of about 25 people in a battalion formation, you know, they have to make sure that all the orders are cut, that people have got all their medical stuff taken care of, you know, all the supplies and logistics are in place, et cetera, et cetera. But also before a training event, it's a huge difference if, if that full-time force has the, if you will, the convoy lined up, the trucks fueled, uh, the weapons loaded, you know, or they're already out on the range and that unit, the first sergeant calls formation, in a matter of about an hour, they're getting on vehicles and they're moving on Friday night, so that when we wake up Saturday morning or sometime during the night, Friday night, we're rolling onto ranges and we're getting ready to start shooting. Versus, we show up Friday night, we got to load out, line up, fuel up, 
and then we move on Saturday morning and we don't start shooting until sometime around lunch. So, so those, those, those hours, if you replicate those over really a 39-day uh, process, can cost you dearly in, in how you uh, continue to build readiness in your force. Um, the, the other part is, is you know, the, the, the nation has to continuously ask itself, how modern do we need our reserve forces? You know, do we need them as modern as our active component? I, that, that's a question that always comes up and has to be determined. But I would tell you that they need to be as ready as we need them to be so that when they show up in a surge, we don't lose momentum. And the, combat, and the combatant commander looks at us and says, okay, you look just like the first guys that got here, not the second and third guys. Uh, we lived through that some in Iraq. I mean, that's why we standardized on brigades, you know, strikers, armor, infantry, because we had units showing up, particularly out of the Reserve and National Guard, that a, a combatant commander thought they were asking for X type of brigade combat team, and something else that had morphed over the years showed up, and they were not quite sure how to employ them and maximize their assets. So let me, let me just turn the question slightly then, because uh, maybe Laura or Felix can answer this too. Uh, General Brown is certainly welcome to, is uh, given the, uh, the competing demands of modernization, training, and deployment, uh, and uh, the Army's move towards the sustainable readiness model, uh, have, has, have we managed to strike a better balance in terms of uh, uh, dwell time at home station to prepare our, our deploying units? I'll, I'll start with you, Felix, and then to General Brown. Or have you got anything to add? So I think the first point I make is I, I, I disagree that we are losing redness. I think we're growing redness. I think we, um, certainly within the 3Corps, I think we feel that we are, we are getting more and more ready. But the challenge is indeed one of balance. Uh, and I mentioned the, the time. Um, and it's particularly acute the further down the chain of command you go to. Go, go. And if you speak to a, a company commander or company first sergeant now, um, they are really, really pressed to prioritize their time between maintenance, training, and the bit we've got to be really careful of, and I feel passionate about, is the resiliency as well. We've got to make sure we look after the force, uh, because they've got to be ready to go out the door. And um, uh, I'm not going to tell you we have a solution to it, but it is something we have to f constantly focus on to make sure that we find time to do all those things um, and balance the, uh, the most valuable resource we have, which I believe is time. Right, absolutely, and Bob. Yeah, I'd pile on the, uh, the balance. I think one thing is, is obvious, the pace is going to pick up. I think there is some, particularly some of the older folks that think, oh, it'll slow down, it'll go back to the way it was. The pace is only going to get faster. It's, so I see uh, uh, what's happened. We've been uh, very fortunate to have a uh, uh, Joint Pacific multi-range complex, which is essentially a mini CTC in the Pacific. And I, I think this is the next revolution and home station training, uh, the next revolution in training. When you look, the CTCs were a revolution in training. And we're going to have to improve home station training so you can get the complexities to actually attain Objective T uh, and, and train yourself in such a manner. And you can't do that without uh, one of these. And where do we put them throughout? But it's, it's going to be required, one of these uh, uh, home station mini CTCs that really gets at the quality and the balance. You can maximize your readiness opportunities. We're not able to do that now. We don't have the ability, and, and therefore, uh, that causes this spin that's going even faster. Right. Um, so I have to say a couple of things. Yeah. Um, so on the, on the reserve component side of the house, so National Guard specifically, the common thing is uh, the lack of time. So that's the biggest limb fact. After that, it's personnel, and so and it's on both the RC and the and the AC. And so, um, in terms of what we uh, our guidance when you, when the the guard has to make a choice because they only have so many days to train. And the thing is, is that the uh, you also got to have these are the same people that we're trying to keep in the force while we're trying to recruit more. And so, when you have to make the we, we for the guard, um, we say. Just if you have to make a choice between the individual or the collective, do the individual because we can make up the collective uh, during mobilization. We cannot make up the, uh, the individual readiness. And so if you have to make a choice whether to send your soldier to go to school in order to get promoted, the end of the guidance has been go send that soldier to school, get promoted so we can keep them and they don't end up getting out and that sort of thing. In terms of the, on the, I, I would say everybody's really busy. 
um, but I would, I would say a couple of things. So specifically on how do we do modernization too. Well, we just had the Army Synchronization and Resourcing Conference. We have it twice a year at Forcecom. That's an Army conference. Everybody comes and we sort out and synchronize all the requirements in the Army. CTCs, exercises with COCOMs, modernization, tests that have to be done operational tests for new equipment and those kinds of things. And so that's all synchronized. We have direct, or we have uh, uh, Durloth for the, um, um, with the, with the CFTs to our cores and divisions as well, uh, down to certain levels in order to coordinate directly as part of that, uh, facilitating that by try to side, getting it in the hands of new systems in the hands of warfighters sooner to give the feedback from the soldiers. And so that is working well. But I'll tell you what, uh, and I mentioned it before, back to basics. I would say that, and we were having the discussion with, uh, with General Garrett and with Sergeant Major Grinston, um, our Force Comm Sergeant Major on the way down here, talking about when you go back to basics. So the Secretary of the Army has done the, the 14 directives where he's gotten rid of over 200 like admin requirements for units to do. And so in that same vein, um, if they, we were having a discussion about a training meeting and, uh, and the SAR major had sat through, you know, he shows up for, for little things unannounced and that kind of thing. So he sat through a, a training meeting and, um, and you had this company that was going to be doing, a, uh, they were going to be doing a range. And so the, 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 the young captain said he had everything but people to actually conduct the range, right? And so right there in the training meeting, the other company commander took over the range and said, I'll do the range. And not once did the battalion commander say, okay, what, what are you not doing that was on your training calendar that I approved by you taking that range, right? And what are you going to do when you're supposed to be doing the range? What are you going to do in place of that? And so I would say some of that, getting back to the basics on how to do training management and how to do training meetings, um, we need to do as well. So uh, anyway, uh, I'll stop great, there. Great insight. Thanks. So we're almost out of time, and, but I, there's a great question here, and I'm just going to leave it as a comment uh, for everybody to ponder as we depart. And one of the uh, uh, new... Uh, aspects of multi-domain operations is we extended the battlefield framework all the way back to home station. So fort to port is no longer considered uh, uncontested. And the NORTHCOM commander recently said as much that we can no longer consider CONUS as a sanctuary. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we need to think about is how we secure our ports and our ability to project power from them, A pods and uh, S pods. Uh, uh, so, um, or A pose and S pose, sorry. Uh, so that uh, obviously has a lot of implications for our uh, Compo 2 and 3 brethren and anybody who is in or is heading to NORTHCOM uh, will have to uh, uh, focus on that for us as well. Uh, and with that, we're uh, just about at the end of our time, so I'd like to thank all of our panelists and uh, just point out that the best time to buy a straw hat is in the winter time and uh, the best time to prepare for war is when you're not uh, in the middle of one. So uh, uh, this is a very timely discussion and uh, you know I, I, I hope uh, it was illuminating for all of you here uh, in attendance. So thanks again to everybody. Cool. Thanks, sir. Great job, sir. Hey, I hope you can do six hundred. But thanks, uh, Jim McFarland, and thanks for the, the panelists all for a for a great uh, a, a great job to, to wrap us up on day two. I would add just one comment to what General Curtis talked about in this dif more difficult balancing act for the Army National Guard and Army Reserve, and that is the tremendous support required by by, by employers around the country and the employer support for the Guard and Reserve. And so many of you from an industry who, who do, in fact, employ Guard and Reserve uh, service members, we, we need your continued support. That's vitally, vitally important. One bit of news, uh, thanks to those of you who are here. Uh, our attendance at the Global Force Symposium 2019 has already exceeded the total attendance last year. So congratulate yourselves. Thank you very much for that.
Thanks to DynCorp for your refreshments, and we'll see you back here tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock. Thanks, Sean.